This is the story of Hapag Lloyd Flight 3378. Problems only become problems only if you let it. Sure, that sounds like a motivational quote, but it's true. Identifying an issue and working towards rectifying it can nip a potentially disastrous issue in the bud. But if you let it grow out of control, the results can be catastrophic. It was the 12th of July, 2000. An Airbus A310 operated by Hapag Lloyd was on the ground at Chania International Airport in Greece. Today, they'd be heading for the German town of Hanover. The plane had 143 passengers and eight crew members aboard. The plane took off from Chania. The takeoff was normal. The plane rotated into the Greek sky. Positive rate established. The plane was climbing normally. The crew retracts the landing gear and they look at the landing gear lights, expecting all the lights to turn off, indicating that the landing gears had been retracted into the wheel bay of the airplane. But they were presented with red gear unsafe lights and the door open warning lights. They tried a few more times, still the same results. The gears would not retract. The pilots decided to reduce the rate of climb given the configuration of their airplane. The plane was still flying. It just had its landing gears out. As far as malfunctions went, this was a minor one. The pilots decided to press on to their destination. The plane was still flying. They had to keep a close eye on the fuel, as the lowered gears would create a lot more drag. They were quite busy in the cockpit as the high frequency radio wasn't working. The pilots had to use A cars and Stockholm radio to communicate with the ground crew to try and diagnose the issue. With the help of the ground crew and the flight management system, the captain decided to divert to Munich. The plane was burning fuel way too fast. They wouldn't be able to make Hanover. But the crew makes a fatal mistake. The FMS or the flight management system does not take into consideration the drag of the landing gears on the airplane. This greatly reduces their range, so Munich was not in their reach as well. But the crew did not know this yet. At about 12 p.m., the crew realized that their calculations were way off. They wouldn't be able to make it to Munich. They just didn't have the fuel that was needed. With the situation getting more dire, the pilots decided to divert to Vienna, which was much closer. As the flight progressed, the first officer kept tabs on their fuel situation. Still only a third of the way to Vienna, and still inside Greece. The first officer checks in on their fuel situation. The FMS predicts that they'd have about 1.9 tons of fuel when they arrive at Vienna. In aviation terms, they're running on fumes. Regulations said that they now had to divert to the nearest airport, which at this point was Zagreb, a mere 10 minutes away. But they pressed on to Vienna, still expecting a normal landing. A few minutes later, they overflew Zagreb. As they made their way towards Vienna, they contacted Vienna ATC and asked for a direct approach. If they didn't have a direct approach, they decided to land at Graz. This made Vienna ATC inquire about their unusual request and found out that the plane was low on fuel. The pilots still did not declare an emergency; they just kept flying towards Vienna. As the plane's fuel reserves hit 1.9 tons, the fuel that they were supposed to have when they landed at Vienna, the first officer asks the captain to declare an emergency, but the captain didn't budge. With 1,300 kilos of fuel left, the low fuel lights in the cockpit turned on. At this time, the plane was 42 nautical miles from Zagreb, 85 nautical miles from Graz, and 131 nautical miles from Vienna. Soon after, the crew declared a fuel emergency, but they still pressed on to Vienna. With the situation going from bad to worse, the pilots decided to look into the very real possibility of diverting to Graz. But they found that the approach charts for Graz were not available in their cockpit. The crew discuss about the FMS in the cockpit. The first officer is of the opinion that the FMS can't be trusted, as it is probably not factoring in the drag caused by the landing gear. But the captain overrides him. The captain asks the first officer to not ask for emergency services post landing, and he asks the first officer to put off flap extension for as long as possible. If I may detract from the given facts and indulge you in a little bit of personal speculation. I find these actions by the captain very confusing. 
He knows that the plane is in danger, but he asks for no emergency services? We know that the captain knows that the plane was in danger because he asked the co-pilot to delay the deployment of flaps for as long as possible. Deploying flaps does generate more lift at low speeds, but it also does generate a lot of drag and ergo eats up more fuel. Why he's acting so strangely, I do not know. He asks the first officer to adhere to this, especially if the engines do flame out. At 12 nautical miles from the airport, the unthinkable happens. Dual engine flame out. Flight 3378 was now a glider. The first officer restarts the engines for a few more minutes of thrust. The plane glided towards the runway at Vienna. They were going to be cutting it close. The left wing of the airplane clips the ground 660 meters from the threshold of the runway. The left landing gear digs into the soft, mossy ground around the runway, and it collapses 22 meters later. The plane skidded on the left engine and the right landing gear as it overran runway lighting. The plane came to rest at the start of the runway. All aboard had survived, but 26 people did receive small injuries. An investigation finds out that an improperly fastened nut in the landing gear assembly had shifted by 10 millimeters, which prevented the landing gear from completely retracting. Yes, a 20 cent nut was to blame for the loss of a multi-million dollar jet, but that's just half the story. What really sealed the fate of the airplane was how the crew reacted. The main mistake that the pilots made was trusting the FMS for their fuel information. The co-pilot correctly questioned the fuel readouts given by the FMS, but he was new to the aviation industry and the captain was more experienced. This may have played a part in why the captain disregarded the co-pilot's opinion. But the manufacturer of the plane, Airbus, hadn't really provided the crew with the details on how the FMS would behave in a situation like this. The captain was also in the dark, so to speak. The report says that the crew didn't have enough information about the FMS and that they didn't know that they were being fed incorrect information. This led them to make decisions based on incorrect information. The captain was blamed for the tragedy as well. The plane should have diverted to Zagreb when the fuel reserves were down to such dangerously low levels. That's what he should have done. The captain's obsession with getting to Vienna can be explained away by a psychological phenomenon called pressing on. The captain viewed a diversion to Vienna as a success and a landing at Zagreb as a failure and thus the captain went on ahead towards Vienna. The crew were heavily worked and was under a lot of stress and this could have played a part in their decision making. It's incredible that such a small issue snowballed into a crisis that ended up destroying a plane. Accidents like these are why we have strict rules about how planes are flown and how long pilots can work. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. A big thank you to iTrapper for letting me use his amazing footage on my channel. If you do like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. I'll catch you guys next time.